Hey guys, Dominic Neshi here from Cribs. I'm very excited uh, to have Tom Panos here today. Thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure. Mate, Tom, you've been doing this for a very long time. You've been all over TV. You've got your own podcast. You've got your own agents uh, coaching. You regularly comment on real estate. So you were actually one of the first people that I saw um, do a podcast. And I took inspiration from that about two, three years ago. And that inspired me to do a lot of this. So thanks That's for coming thing. onto the podcast. It's awesome. Um, mate, let's just start off. I, I want to just ask a, a very open question to begin with. Can you just give us a little bit of a, a background for those that don't know who you are, you know, what your interest in property is? Do you own any, you know, how do you work with agents, that kind of stuff, who you are and what you're about? And then I want to ask you some deep diving questions. Okay. Um, in terms of me and property myself, I um, uh, own probably about $25 million, $27 million dollars of, of property, very little debt, zero debt. Um, and I've been buying property since um, 21, 22 years of age. I buy and have bought in the inner west. Um, it has normally been property that has had a terrible yield. Uh, none of the five, six or seven percents you get with a lot of people in commercial industrial and not the fives or four percents that people get in areas like Liverpool. But they have been suburbs that have had high capital growth, right? And that was a bit of luck, Dominic, you know, because the areas that I was buying, Enmore, you know, Newtowns, um, St. Peter's, um, it wasn't an attractive area. So um, I was buying at a time that it was um, affordable and um, I stuck to that strategy and yeah but you know lately I've been buying blocks of units you know that's been my preferred choice that's that's a good income producing asset to go and get a whole block of units let me just before we jump into this I want to ask you because I imagine I live in St Peter's now and I bought the apartment that I'm in um, even when I purchased it which was many years ago like five years ago or something People were saying, oh, St. Peter's, I don't know about that area. I imagine you would have had some naysayers or more people saying no in your ears than yes. How did you like, calibrate your decision making when there's so many people around you saying that this is a shitty area or there's junkies there or whatever? How do you recalibrate your internal clock to say, I want this? Well, the first thing you do is not just listen to the advice, but you listen who the advice is from. So if the advice is coming from someone who hasn't made money out of property, you automatically don't give it too much attention because they're looking at the world through their lens and their lens has shown that they haven't actually been successful. So you wouldn't actually follow that because you might be getting inaccurate advice. So um, then you turn around and say, hey, do I back myself or do I actually take another person's view? And I think it helps to get views of people that have got the success that you want. So you time travel. You say, hey, I'm looking at that guy or girl and they're 40 years of age and they own like $15 million worth of real estate. You know what? If they say something, I'm going to pay attention to it. But if I'm going to get my uncle who's a butcher to say to me, don't go to St. Peter's, the planes go over there, right? I'm not going to listen to his advice because he might be a butcher that has taken 30 years to buy one property. He's not working for CoreLogic. He hasn't got access to the data. He's giving you anecdotal evidence. So I think to answer your question specifically, don't listen to the advice. Listen firstly who it's coming from. The next thing is you find someone that has got runs on the boards and you sit there from a period uh, uh, from a position of curiosity and that was the case for me I mean there was particularly one person who owned a lot of real estate and I copied uh, his strategy he was a uh, 30 years older than me I'll share his name his name's George Pappas he died two years ago and I haven't seen him for years but all I remember Dominic is that he was one of our landlords in my real estate company 
And I was curious because my business partner, George, who's still in real estate now, I'd say to him, mate, I want to speak to George. Let me speak to George today. And I would sit there and I'd be sussing him out, you know, sussing him out. Like you, like now you're asking me questions, I would be asking him questions. And he taught me um, the strategy and he basically said, what you've got to do is just keep buying as close as possible to the city, even if they're yucky houses, even if the area doesn't look good, just keep thinking about it. Out further out, they'll keep cutting up land and they'll make more stuff. But here, they can't do it, so it'll put pressure on prices. And he was right. He was right because I look at you know things I've bought, you know, for Fitzroy paid one, one ninety two hundred. It's you know worth close to two mil. You know, Williams Terraces. All these properties were bought for one fifty two hundred back then. Williams know. Terraces. That's uh, Weemus. Al- Weemus. Oh, Weemus. W e m y double s. Two terraces there in Enmore. Ah. Right. Um, um, That's a great strategy. He's, he's just talking about supply and demand there. Really correct. Okay, I want to come back to buying, but before we do that, you're currently spending a lot of time working with agents, turning yeah. them into better agents, coaching, and and this is a little bit cheeky, but a lot of the people listening to this podcast are purchasers. I want to ask you some questions about how to deal with agents, how to spot a good or bad agent, how to sort of work with them to maximize that encounter. So the first question here is, how? firstly, how do you spot a good or bad agent um, and then how does this affect you as a buyer? What are the advantages and disadvantages with dealing with a good or a bad agent? Like how can you play the situation, if you will? If you know that okay. you... Yeah. So there's two questions. Good agent as a buyer, good agent as a vendor. Mm. Yeah? So as a buyer. As a buyer. So as in, as in you're a buyer and you're encountering the vendor's agent and they're you know, non-responsive or they talk too much, it seems like they're dishonest or something. So you're talking about the the agent that represents the uh, the vendor? The vendor. How, how do you pick one? Well, I think if you're a buyer, you must make the assumption that that real estate agent is getting paid. Well, it's not an assumption, it's a fact. They're getting paid by the vendor. So you must then take the assumption that whatever they do, whatever they say is going to actually be in favor of that vendor. With that information, that basically means that you, as a buyer, should actually become self-sufficient. You should become a person that does your own research. You should become the Google of the marketplace yourself because you don't want to become dependent on someone that has a conflict of interest, and that is that they're talking to you, but is in fact they're representing the vendor. So I would say, number one, how do you spot one? A better question would be is, how do I actually become so good that it doesn't matter whether the agent is good or bad, I actually want to buy the property, right? Mm. Um, The second thing is that, um, generally speaking, we live in a world now where you can actually find out about the reputation of people faster and better than 20 years ago. And uh, that is because of Google, that is because of rating sites. The fact is that today I'm looking for a Japanese restaurant in Newtown and I am going to basically go and type Japanese Newtown and look at reviews. I'm not going to go on a website and study, you know, teppanyaki on King and hear what they have to say mm. because what they're going to say suits themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to other consumers and uh, you've got access to that online. I would do a lot of social interviews. I love social interviews. In other words, what I'm saying, Dominic, is if I want to suss someone out, it's important to me, I go to LinkedIn, I go to Insta, I go to Facebook, and I listen to what they've said for the last 30 days. I don't listen to what they say to me in that meeting because what they say to me in that meeting suits themselves. What they've been putting on social media, they can't help it, is a reflection of who they are. That's interesting. So what you're saying there is that it really doesn't matter who you're dealing with. Is how you conduct yourself, what research you've done, your understanding of the market, and then the property you're trying to buy. This person in the middle is a mediator. Mm. They're obviously working for the uh, the vendor. So take whatever they're saying with a grain of salt because it's all going to be geared towards helping the vendor ultimately, and you should go and sort of arm with that at the front of your mind. Correct. Correct. You should sit there and... You know, um, 
challenge them on what they say things. They say to them, you know, this is a good buy at 780000 You say, well, let me tell you, I've actually bought the three properties that have recently sold in the last 14 days, and the three most comparable properties are 743 755 and 760 I actually think you need to realign the value of that property by 25000 and that's when it's a good buy. That's what a good buyer does. Mm, okay, so you've got to almost outsmart the agent in that position. Yeah. Are there any... Uh, this is... You know, and I, I and I say this question with all due respect to agents because I am an agent. I've worked in an agency for a long time, and ninety nine percent of the market is, you know, good industry professionals that are working for the vendor and doing the best job they can, giving good transparent advice. But I also know as an agent, there are different sales techniques. There are different ways to uh, navigate a situation, so ultimately they can get the best result for the vendor. Yeah. Are there any traps or any things things that a buyer should be mindful of when they're working with an agent or anything that they should be cautious of or be aware of to a new purchaser? I mean, people buy property, but not very often. Yeah. So I want to try to give them some hints and tips when they go and work with an agent. Things to be mindful of listening to. Are there any phrases or are there, is there something that you're, they're going to do to sort of bait or try and get more out of the interaction than you're willing to give? Okay. So one of the things that you can do is be armed with good questions um, to ask the agent. And the person that actually asks the most questions will end up having the power in that conversation. And the reason why is you'll then have the ability to listen more. And the person that listens more has more power in any negotiation. So one of the questions I think is a good question is to ask, if you're a buyer, is what would have to happen today in terms of price for your vendor to sign a contract? And you shut up and you let them say what it is, right? Then if you get a response that's higher than the number that you'd be paying, wanting to pay, a better question then to add is, and this is not saying you're putting an offer in, saying, would I be wasting my time if I were to sign a contract at 700 and shut up? You're not even saying I'm putting an offer. Would I be wasting my time signing a contract at 700? Because ultimately... What a good buyer wants to do is get the other party to put the cards on the table. Interesting. So you're asking probing questions and giving enough space in the conversation for them to talk. Yeah. Don't fill in that awkward space. Just shut yeah. up. Yeah. Then allow that agent to reveal their cards. Correct. So don't be the first person to reveal that number if you can avoid it. Correct. But then test the waters and parameters of where that number might be with yeah. open and probing questions. Correct. Brilliant. And then use the what if. And I think what if is very underestimated. There are specific. You've asked me for specific words and what if is a very good piece of dialogue to use to say to if, if the agent turns around and says, no, 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 you'd be wasting your time. Then respond back with what if it was 7.05? No, 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 we're way off. And all you're doing is asking questions for them to actually say, listen, it had have to be 7.30, right? And then I encourage buyers to learn what is called the walk-away strategy because, Dominic, a lot of the times you're not going to truly know where the other party is till you walk away. That's interesting. It's, it, it reminds you of an old saying, you don't know what you got till it's gone almost. Correct. Correct. So, you know, let me ask you then, because these these strategies, I think, work better when there's less competition, supply and demand, which we are talking about earlier. Um, is there space for a more pointed or a more direct way of purchasing, especially when it's a hot market, when you're going inner west and you're seeing... 60 people come through the open home. Is it still the same sub type of conversation? Are you still walking away and waiting for the next home when you're emotionally invested in this purchase? Okay. So when you're 
in an auction marketplace, mm. the situation that you have there is quite different because you are on stage in transparent conditions with other people and you can see what they're paying and what you're paying. And walking away can mean that you actually miss out on the property in an auction scenario. I think the other question that you're sort of saying is, so what do you do in marketplaces where it's super hot? Um, probably stay there. And the reason I say that is if it's super hot, Right now, it's going to be super hot when you're a seller. It's super hot for a reason, and that is the reasons you want to buy it is lots of other reasons people want to buy it. So what's the alternative? You leave Enmore and you say, I don't want to compete with all these people, and I'll go off and I'll buy in Blacktown, right? Because I've got no competition. So here's the deal. You'll save a buck now, but you're going to be paying for that difference over the years because as capital growth takes place, the area that had the demand will probably still have the demand. So I say to people, hey, listen, you know, if bargain hunting is your strategy in real estate, you're not going to make good money. And the reason is you're not going to be buying the kind of property that has good capital growth. So... What's yeah. bargain hunting? Bargain hunting. Bargain hunting. If, you, bargain, if, you, if you're a bargain hunter, if you turn around and say, oh, I'm looking for bargains, the bargains are white where there's no buyers. Yes, okay. Right? Yeah. And you're going to feel like you've got something now, but the reality is 10 years down the track, Dominic, all I'll say is that one area will probably go up 6% a year, the other one will go up 10% a year, and... Um, that money that you saved at purchase time, you'll actually end up um, losing down the track because of the opportunity cost of not having bought in a better capital growth area. Okay. So um, I want to touch on that just very quickly because there's two things. One, we want to be looking at good, high-performing markets where the yield is going to be lower, closer to CBDs, but yeah. then in the same token you want to do what you did as well which is look for those areas that are maybe not so popular still close to cbds right so they might not be as yeah. popular as say surrey hills but we might go out a little bit further erskineville or maybe not to say erskineville isn't popular but keep on going out so i would say so firstly let me just say a lot of this boils down to is what age you're at too right mm. because when you're 20 and 30 you want growth right you want growth you don't care that you're going to get 2% yields at the end, right? But you know that you're picking up 10% growth. So you buy something for a mill, you make 1.1, you know, in year one. You know, year two, you've made over 1.2. You're making 100 grand minimum each night while you go to sleep, mm. right? However, when you get to the age of 50, like myself, 52, all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, man, the growth is more than I'll ever need, what I want to do is actually have cash come in and give me freedom to wake up to do a podcast or freedom to wake up and go to Byron Bay for three days, come back, make up my mind, I want to go to Seminyak, come back. I need cash for that. So then all of a sudden you begin to say, hey, it's a different strategy and you know, you'll look at service stations where that you get much higher yields, no worries about tenants ringing up all that but so we should cover you know it depends on what age cycle that you're in however as a golden rule we're sitting here in Chippendale yep. you can't afford in Chippendale what do you do you go to Newtown you can't afford Newtown you go to Enmore you can't afford New Enmore you go to uh, Marrickville you can't afford Marrickville go to Dulwich Hill you can't afford Dulwich Hill go to Canterbury so a simple rule is what you do is you pick the suburb that's next to the suburb that has going off or has gone off and you go west and that's why we have seen suburbs in the last few years that people would say, what? Canterbury? All of a sudden, Canterbury appears to be on the shopping list for people that couldn't afford to buy in Newtown. Then went to Maryville and they thought, wow, it's 1.5 million here, we can't there. Go to Canterbury, can't afford Canterbury, okay. What do we do? Oh, Campsie. 
And Campstead is an interesting one. I know we're not talking about suburbs, but what actually happens is occasionally you hit a suburb that you've gone west from and it might have some uh, strong um, cultural issue. It might have something about that area that is either super attractive to people or it actually can be very negative to people. Like, for instance, um, let's talk about you know a church or a mosque. To certain people, they love it. To other people, they don't, right? So what actually happens is then you look at certain areas and you say, hey, in this area, is it going to have demand enough, right? So sometimes you'll end up going west, but there could be a suburb that you end turn around and say, hey, this suburb's got a few issues there that concern me, and then you might even go further west. But the short answer, Dominic, is you pick the suburb next to the suburb that's gone off as long as this suburb hasn't taken off. It's usually a good formula. Interesting. I like it. So just watch where the market's going. Let me let me ask you a couple other questions now. So I want to ask you this yeah. because you've obviously got quite a few properties there. How do you pick a good rental manager? When you're sitting down from this manager, they all seem great. How do you how are you judging this person? What kind of qualities are you looking for in a person that's going to look after your property? What kind of questions? How do you assess these agents? Okay, generally speaking, my properties are managed by people that are mates, right? So maybe I'm not a good example because I come from the real estate world, right? Here it is. So what's happened is in the real estate world, I already have trust with people, people that I might play squash with, people that I hang out with, people that I was in business with. So what happens is, Dominic, there's trust in the relationship. When there's trust in the relationship, I don't need to look at a CV. I don't need to look at a presentation. Let's talk about the people that don't have trust in a relationship and they're sitting there and interviewing for a property manager. Well, the first thing I would say is I would ask the property manager to provide me with their statistics. How many days on market generally do they have properties before they rent them out? I would ask them um, things like, can I ask you, how many properties did you lease out last month? Can I ask you, can you provide me the names, mobiles and emails of the five last properties that you leased out? I'd like to talk to them. Not give me some testimonials. No, give me the last five. Because when you say give us testimonials, you'll always pick the ones that suit, right? Give me the last five. So I want the ones from October, right? Um, The other thing I'll say is people shouldn't stress out. Because if you hire a property manager, that's a dud. Mm. Dominic, it's not the end of the world. It's not a. There are certain decisions that are irreversible in life, and there are certain decisions that are reversible. For instance, irreversible. Think of something. Okay, irreversible. To a young person, ecstasy tablets, mm. right? There's three of them there. You could put those in. And you may, you may end up getting the one that's laced with rat poison. You're gone. You're gone, right? That's not reversible. Property management. I hire a property manager. He's silky smooth with his language. He puts an incredible sales performance. Signs me up, and after that, it's terrible. You know what? You give people 30 days notice, and you say, that's it. So there's nothing to really stress out about because you can actually make your decision during the relationship, whether Mm. you stay with them or leave. So don't sweat it. Go go, go talk to these people. Ask the questions that Tom's clearly put forward, and they're all great questions. I like, you know, to give me your last five um, and then just carry on with the conversation, move on to the next one if you don't like who this agent is. Okay, so last couple of questions, Tom. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but what are the best and worst things that you've done when you're buying property? Best and worst in buying. Best and worst in buying. Okay, the best things I've done is bought properties without having looked, believe it or not, that sounds weird, without having looked at a contract, without having done a building inspection, I've been there, I've looked at the property, it's got to a price, I wasn't even going there with intention to buy. And that was the case with Fitzroy Street, Newtown. And I still, and I hadn't even seen the house. And I thought to myself, but that's good value. And the reason why is I may not have done the pest and the building. I may not have done the uh, evaluation, but I had already 
being the Google of the market. Mm. And when the agent said to me, Tom, it's a good buy, I already knew that. I didn't have to have the agent to tell me because if everything has sold for 240, 250, and you're there and you can pick it up for 195 and you turn around and say, but I haven't done a pest or building. You know what? Guess what? It's unrenovated anyway. So I'm renovating. So guess what? Yes, there might be termites. Okay, so we change the floorboards. I'll allow 10 grand, but it's still a bargain. Mm. Whereas everyone else sits there and says, oh, yeah, but what if there's this big problem? Guess what? The opportunity won't be there then, and you miss out on it. So what I do is I go on instinct. That's the first thing. The second thing tips on this is question on tips on buying mm. dominic you've got to put time and what i mean by time is more people spend time posting social media pics than looking for real estate right so the only way you have power is between the portals, CoreLogic, RP Data, realestate.com, is that you basically become a valuer yourself in the area and that you go out and you put some time and energy inspecting properties. So that way, when you have instinct, you're you know, buying from a position of strength because you know the stuff. So I would say to every buyer, you should be allocating around five to seven hours a week towards your purchase and that will involve studying the prices that are going and inspecting properties and talking to agents and getting into agents little black books because real estate agents do have black books and that is they've got what is called pocket listings a pocket listing is a listing that is not on the portals that is not on the market that they have sitting in their top pocket and the owner has said, if you've got a buyer that's prepared to pay this price and is prepared to actually buy by this period, we're a seller. And what happens is real estate agents will go to their buyers and they'll do what is called a real off-market transaction, which is no one knows about it. And how do you do that? You get into a relationship with agents in the area you want to buy. That's brilliant. I've spoken to a few uh, buyers as well. So Chris Gray Chris talks Gray. about this. Um, Simon Cohen talks about this. All the best buyers out there really dedicate themselves to the markets that they're working in. They understand it back to front. So, And they said that the most important thing is the relationship with these purchase or with the buyers, because um, the agents, because you get these off-market transactions. So Really what I'm taking from you is you can't go out and purchase property willy-nilly. You need to either have an expert that's put the time in or you need to put the time in. Correct. There's and, no shortcut. And with Chris Gray and Simon Cohen, people go to them and say, hey, listen, I'll pay you X percent. You do that. But they've got relationships with agents, right? Um, but you don't need a buyer's agent as well. You could choose to do that yourself. Certainly. You know? yeah. If you go dedicate the seven hours a week and you do all the inspections, in the space of a month, you'll be an expert, I 100%. think. 100%. What's the dumbest things that you've seen purchasers do? The dumbest things I've seen purchasers do is bid at an auctions without getting finance approved, not having a checkbook. Like I've seen it quite a few times. You know, the hammer goes down, first, second, third, final call, done, sold, sir, congratulations. And they come up and they say, okay, fantastic. Can you tell us what happens next? And I say, oh, well, we've just got to take the 10%. And they say, Oh, but we're going to go speak to the bank next week. We we've just started looking, and I just say you've bought you bought a property. Like that's it. <laughs> it's yours. I said there's no no going. I, I said you've got to pay the ten percent deposit. Oh, but we want to bring um, bring our uncle through to have a look as well. I said bring bring him in. But it's your house. It's now. your house now. <laughs> you know. So that's 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 not a really really smart thing. The other thing is, you know, on the weekend. Like here's a classic example. It was an auction nearby on the weekend. We're sitting there, and I'm about to start the auction, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, can I get everyone out? And there's a couple there, and they're sitting there, and they're saying, but the sofa, the sofa, I go, do you guys want to register? And they said, yeah, we've, we've been following this right through, but we're just not sure our sofa we've, won't fit in there. And you're thinking to yourself, why wouldn't you buy a new sofa? Like, what are you sitting there trying to work out whether you're going to buy this house? Our sofa won't fit in here. Or where will we put the fridge? I mean, I think what they some, some dumb things people do is they major on minor decisions. 
I love that. Major and minor decisions. Yeah. I know a lot of people like that. Yeah. You're stressing about something that's completely irrelevant. Correct. You're yeah. going too, too granular. Like, listen, you're spending a million bucks. That stuff would cost you a thousand. Correct. Calm down. Correct. You know, things like, just things like that. Another person once said, oh, you know, like, has it got, I've got a, he had a Tesla. That's why I got into the conversation. He, he had a he had a Tesla and he said, oh, where's there a, you know, a, you know, there's no Tesla charging place around here. I said, well, you just buy a t- Tesla charger for 500 bucks. And he goes, oh, yeah, where would you put it? I said, put it wherever you, whatever you, you Get know. Get an extension cord. I don't yeah, know like so, that. so they're, they're the sorts of stuff that I think uh, are there and, and um, that would probably, uh, that would probably, the occasional person that thinks that they're going to buy real estate and make a buck within 18 months, you know, that's that's not highly intelligent. I mean, um, real mm. estate, you know, real estate is about people buying a property, signing the contract, getting that contract and then putting it into a top drawer and not looking at it and knowing that they're making about 100 grand a year while they sleep and then they wake up 10 years later and they realise, wow, I made a million bucks. I've got no other money because you've normally people just live to their expenses, but they've got this million dollar growth that they've had in real estate because they had the patience to lock that contract in the file, not sit there and stare at a screen like a share trader does to say, how much has it gone up today, right? That is not a sign of a good property person. Right? Mm. A property person does not keep score each day. No, I agree. Completely agree. And lucky last, lucky last, where are you spending or where would you recommend someone go and spend a lazy half a million and million dollars? Two different price points. If you're, you're, you're in the market today and you want to spend a million dollars and yeah. $500,000, what kind of markets would you be looking at purchasing? Um, half a million? Yeah. Half a million. I would uh, look at an Art Deco um, an Art Deco apartment, not a new one. I'd look at an Art Deco apartment as close as possible to the city. So if you're in Sydney or in Melbourne, what you would do is you just keep putting the parameter extra three kilometres, extra three kilometres until you get to 500,000 that you can get yourself even a one better, mm-hmm. right? Art Deco charm character they can't duplicate that no developer is going to come along and actually build exactly the same thing not going to have you know um so i like i like those art deco units i also for it for for a million but you know ultimately the position is more important than anything else so the closer in the better right for a million for a million bucks i would again i'm biased you got to remember you're talking to a person that is biased because i've made a fortune in the inner west so i'd stick to something that has worked i'd be looking at uh mate even the area that you like i sold a property in st peter's um three weeks ago and um i thought to my sutherland street st peter's mm. went for 970 off the top of my head unrenovated two bedroom terrace terrace two bedroom terrace totally unrenovated no nine, car spot uh no car spot right I would have bought that under a million bucks. A nice, you know, a nice terrace there. Um, so I'd again look, you know, in a west for around a million, a house that needs work. Love it. I, I respect exactly what you're saying because no one has the magic formula, but you can only say what's worked for you. Your strategy's clearly worked. Yeah. A lot of people employ it. Chris Gray loves it. A lot of buyers, agents love that what I call blue chip property. Correct. But then there's other people that live and die by buying stuff in the western suburbs and buying houses and people doing granny flats and duplexes and whatever. Everyone has their method and the way that they like to buy and and have made money in property. I wanted your opinion today. Tom, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dominic. It's been a pleasure being here. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, sir.